I prefer my kids to have two arms, two legs, 10 fingers, 10 toes. That's just me. Hey, sterile processing professionals, Brandon the Sterile Guy here. And in today's video, we're gonna jump into the topic of ethylene oxide, or EO for short. Ethylene oxide used to be the acronym ETO, but that's outdated now. The new acronym is EO. Ethylene oxide is a gas sterilization agent that is used to sterilize instruments, endoscopes, and lots of other surgical materials. But with many advancements in sterilization practices and products themselves, and with the horrific outcomes of what EO can do to a human, we've made a lot of progress in changing the way we do sterilization in the departments. So you find EO in sterile processing departments way less than you used to say two decades ago, three decades ago. And by horrific side effects, I'm talking about like cancers and birth defects, no bueno, but roughly 50%. Yes, 50% of all medical devices and products in America are sterilized with ethylene oxide. So the fact that most sterile processing departments don't have an ethylene oxide sterilizer still shows that the dominance of EO in America is huge. It's mainly used in medical device manufacturing. So all those prepackaged items that you get like four by fours and, and syringes and stuff, the majority of all those things are ethylene oxide sterilized. So it's very frequent, just further behind the scenes. And I want you to know up front, I'm not saying ethylene oxide is bad. I'm not saying you shouldn't use it. This is just a video for information. So first let's cover what ethylene oxide is. EO is a colorless and flammable gas and apparently also has a lightly sweet odor. I can't personally verify that because honestly, I'm not gonna give it a whiff. I prefer my kids to have two arms, two legs, 10 fingers, 10 toes. That's just me. EO is a form of ether. And if you're at all familiar with ethers, depending on the ether compound, they can make up a wide variety of different substances, which include dyes, paints, plastics, varnishes, and even like insecticides. Sounds like a chemical you wanna be around every day, right? EO formulation is C2H4O, which means it has two carbons, four hydrogen atoms, and one oxygen atom. It is what is known as a cyclic ether and looks like a triangle or a pyramid kind of structure. Chemistry is so crazy to me how different atoms can be bonded together in different ways and create some of the most vital substances we need and some of the most horrific and dangerous substances from the same types of atoms. So ethylene oxide has these three atoms, right? It has carbon, it has hydrogen, it has oxygen. Well, let's take a look at something else. So having carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen creates ethylene oxide, which is highly dangerous. But there's other substances that have the same atoms, like let's think of blood glucose. Blood glucose has all three of the same atoms and is very vital for us to survive. But there's a difference with blood glucose. It has six carbon, 12 hydrogen, and six oxygen. So I guess it comes down to how much of the different atoms are bonded together in different ways which creates whether they are a dangerous substance or a vital substance or just a substance that doesn't matter. Way, way above my head for sure, but very interesting nonetheless. Ethylene oxide was first reported in 1859 by a French chemist who was named Charles Adolf Wurtz. As I look back at the creation of these chemicals and substances way back in the day, I can't help but think about the mutations and terrible consequences that some of these early chemists must have faced. They were playing around with some very dangerous compounds with probably very little protection. Yikes. Anyways, to make a longer story short, ethylene oxide was more easily made by direct oxidation by doing so in the presence of a silver catalyst, which apparently makes the process much easier and is still used today. What's funny, knowing the danger of ethylene oxide, it's 
Interesting to know that it was patented in 1938 by an American chemist na named Lloyd Hall, who used it for the preservation of spices, because that's what I want. I want my food to have ethylene oxide. With what we know about EO, how it needs to be thoroughly vented to be safe so that nothing remains on the items or whatever it is you're sterilizing, I can only imagine by the raw forms things were used back then and the, the lack of knowledge of how much remains, how much spices did people eat where they actually ingested ethylene oxide. And to make the history of ethylene oxide just a little bit more doom and gloom, it eventually led to the invention of mustard gas for World War I. Now, if you have an ethylene oxide sterilizer in your sterile processing department, there's some very critical things that you need to know. Two agencies that have very strict standards for EO are the EPA and OSHA. One is for worker safety and the other is for environmental safety. With EPA, there are requirements facilities to have emission control technologies, to have meticulous performance testing, reporting, record keeping, and to have permits to be able to even admit that gas into the environment. Use EO without a permit and see what happens. With OSHA, there's a big list of items to include. This would be like an enclosed and airtight room with negative pressure for the sterilizer, an alarm system, flammable cabinets to store your EO, um, lots of signage in and outside of your department. You need to have written policies and periodic testing to ensure that the sterilizer and the abater is in proper working order. There's so much that needs to happen. And I didn't even mention the training of your facility engineers or maintenance, whatever you call them, for their response to EO emergencies as well. And that alarm is very important and it needs to have that consistent testing and calibration to make sure that it's working well. And those alarms are pretty sensitive. If you use like rubbing alcohol too close to them, that'll set them off too. With EO, there's a lot of advantages with using it. But with those advantages comes high risk for terrible outcomes. And in a department like sterile processing, where the pay is not great, the training is not great, the rush to get things done by cutting corners is not great. The last thing I wanna see in a sterile processing department is an ethylene oxide sterilizer. There are too many risks already to proper disinfection and sterilization. The last thing I wanna add is dangers to staff safety. It was, is, and always will be a good idea that if your department has an ethylene oxide sterilizer, you need to start working on a utilization project to reduce the use of that sterilizer. If you work to not only identify everything that you sterilize in that sterilizer, you then need to engage like a quality committee, supply committee, whatever it is, to start finding replacements for every single one of those items, whether it be a one-time use, whether it be an item that can be steam sterilized or um, hydrogen peroxide vaporized sterilized, finding replacements, and eventually you're gonna windle those down to zero and then that sterilizer becomes useless and that machine will no longer be needed which frees up a space for more storage it frees up the budget for having to perform so much maintenance and calibration on the aeration machine and the sterilizer itself it saves money on not having to calibrate the alarm system it saves headaches from having to revise the policies and see what OSHA and EPA what their latest stuff is it's going to save you a world of problems but most importantly it's going to protect your workers and it's gonna protect the environment. And those are critical. And that, my friends, is the world of ethylene oxide sterilization. Any topics or videos you wanna see, don't hesitate to put them in the comments down below. Don't forget to like and subscribe. I love you guys, and I'll catch you in the next video.